everybody. It's Tyler here at the Championship Check-In Legendary Citrus Circuit 1678. What an incredible season once again. Three blue banners overall and continuing that streak. Hopefully getting on ice end this year. I can't wait to see how they do. Definitely a lock in this division as they go through. Citrus Circuits overall really uh, aiming towards simplicity this year as well too. So we're going to be talking a lot about their philosophy going into that. Of course running through that note journey as well too. Doing some cool things in regards to software. Citrus Circuits always a phenomenal team to talk to as well. So let's learn more about the robot this year in Crescendo on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Emma, let's start off with that intake. I'd love to just hear more about some of the iterations your team has gone through this year. Of course, what you have as well, and anything you want to detail more on it. Yeah, definitely. So, um... For the other than their intake, we originally had 3 8 um, aluminum and pocketed aluminum, and now we actually went with a 6 millimeter polycarb with 1 16th um, aluminum on the sides. And um, that, was ha that happened because at our first competition, we actually um, suffered a lot of bending from the intake plates. So uh, after Wainimi, we went with a more flexible intake. And then uh, something really special about this intake, I'd say, is that it's super easy to switch off intakes, especially if one breaks in the middle of the competition. Um, they're held together by six bolts, so every time something happens, we can just quickly switch it off and fix the intake while we're running a match. How, is, um, how often is that happening right now? Oh, um, we usually swap it when you see severe bending from the intake plate, usually probably like once, maybe twice a competition. Okay. Yeah. It's not too bad. I mean, I see the composition of it looks to be like very rigid and stuff too. Yeah, so definitely. On there. Um, we definitely had some points where the aluminum would actually bend and that would be going outside of frame printers. So but this time we actually made it out of 5052 aluminum so it, we can easily bend it back. Got on here. And then uh, as this intake goes down here, I noticed you got some of these uh, the kind of indexing roller wheels as well too on that. When you were looking uh, at like centering notes, how did you approach that in regards to how you wanted to get your notes centered on your robot? Uh, you can see that we have um, 3D printed uh, blocks that act as funneling for uh, to go to in our indexers. So that's been working pretty well. Yeah. Um, looking back at the crescendo season so far, what is something like, would you want to change anything different or are you pretty happy overall with the product that you have? I like our over the bumper pretty much, but I do see the under bumper intakes. But um, overall, it gives us a larger acquisition zone. Our driver can confidently run into notes without worrying about the note hitting the, um, the bumpers or anything like that. So I think over the bumper has been pretty successful for us and I like it a lot. Let's pass over to Brennan and talk more about uh, some of the different composition and mechanical side. I mean, we got trap mechanism to talk about a little bit more in regards to uh, how your note is being indexed as well, too. And of course, talk about your shooter as well. Absolutely. So basically, after Emma's great intake puts a note through, we're going immediately into our indexer, which is right here. So it starts with these rollers, which is also has a beam break right there on the green mount. So that's how we know that we've begun to really take a note into our system. After that, we have a second beam break right there. That basically says, you know, we've got it in there. After that, there are two different ways the note can go. It can either go up here, which which is done by these wheels spinning upwards, or it goes through the shooter. If we choose to bring it up into the amp, we basically pull up into here, and then this whole thing is on a single stage elevator, so then basically, uh, can we bring the elevator up? And then from here is basically where we can do two different things, amp and trap. So if we're trying to do quick amp cycles, what we can do is we just intake, it goes directly into our tunnel, we, uh, we raise up the elevator, and then we're immediately amping. Otherwise, we can hold it in there and make the choice later. Just depends on whether we're trying to play cleanup closer to the source, or instead if we're just you know going full field cycles to try to get amp notes in. So then, after that, we can also take it into the shooter, which is over here. So basically, if we do that, we come to here. We only have flywheels on one side of our shooter. This is basically just because we found that we really needed spin stability when we were doing a lot of shooter testing in our shop. And we found that really just having those those wheels on one side gets you a lot of spin, which is great, but also was getting us a lot of accuracy when we were Tefloning all of our sides. 
I gotta, I gotta go back real quick on here. Something I've seen amongst a couple of the, uh, we'll, we'll say elite teams out there, uh, is putting some wooden blocks on your robot, honestly, and something other. Just tell me a little bit more about the, uh, uh, the, the thought process behind that and what it's for. Absolutely. You know, our team, I'm not going to say, you know, I can't lie, we're a bit superstitious in a lot of times. Right. And at least for our team, we've been doing wood blocks on our robot since back when we really started to get good in 2013. And so it's really just been a tradition that every single Citrus robot that's ever been made actually has that wood block on it. Uh, it's not always functional. Last year was a nameplate. But for us, it's just the thing we like to do to, you know, make sure we're, we're staying true to who we are. No, I love Make sure we I, keep I love it on the there. robot. Can we see a couple notes that come in and just Absolutely. take a look at where that journey is and narrate uh, a little bit what's happening during that yeah. time? So then this is where we're going to keep it stowed and then uh, we can either amp it and then we spit it out or instead we can intake it and then it shoots through. One of the things I really like about that, when we talk to other teams, sometimes they have to immediately decide if it's going into their shooter or in their app mechanism. I love that you have that choice to stow it and then make that decision later for things. Uh, when you were looking at it, was that like a something that you came up with early on, or is that something that was like later on, like as the meta evolved, that you kind of determined that was a good? Yeah. Call? So for us, basically, we actually built three robots this year. We built our right. Alphabot really quickly, which is what hit the five-node auto, and then after that, we tried to switch to a pretty complicated architecture that had three different pivoting arms. We call it Beta. Beta, unfortunately, did not go so well for us, so we switched to this architecture. And when uh, we were putting together the architecture for this, we realized that we don't always know which one we're going to do, because sometimes an alliance partner can find a stray note that they're going to put in the amp, or sometimes a missed ferry from another team is going to go where, it, where it, we want it to go. So we basically didn't know exactly where we're going to be putting each note, and we realized it's better for us to have the choice to pick instead of being kind of uh, shoehorned into one place over the other. Something I want to ask you is, uh, you know, a lot of teams look up the Citrus circuits, everything we do, not just on the robot, overall as a team as well, too. You know, you got your service pits out there, doing a lot of great things in the community. What are some advice that you, what are some pieces of advice maybe you have the teams who are looking at taking to the next level that want to be a complete team, not just on the robot, but as a team in general? Absolutely. I mean, I think for us, a lot of it's just, we really like what we're doing, you know? Yeah. I think almost every single kid that's out here as, at the entire event loves what they're doing. And I think for us, we just try to take that to the next level ourselves, where it's like, if we love doing something, we want to help other people love it. Like Citrus Service was an idea we started back then because we realized that we had the resources to help people and realized, you know what, this is something that we could and we should do because it helps other people enjoy the event more. So at least for us, a lot of it's just having fun with what we're doing and trying to make sure everyone else can have that fun as well. Yeah, we got to talk about some of the software that goes on with your robot as well. So talk to me more about, uh, got to notice a couple different cameras on here as well, but talk to me about some of the sensors, anything you want to mention uh, from your autos or anything else in regards to programming your robot. Yeah, so one of the, like right off the bat when you look at a robot, one of the most obvious features is our vision system up here. So this year we're running two Arduino cams, one on the left and one on the right, and they're piped into two orange pie processors in this little double deck uh, casing. And essentially on there we run OpenCV's libraries in a Python script, to detect April tags and beam that through the ethernet switch on this side, you can't really see it, but beam that to our Rio. And then on the robot code side, we run full field localization using an extended Kalman filter. And one of the more unique things about our stack is that we actually, instead of fusing full robot pose, we fuse odometry error. So that means we're able to switch between odometry only or full vision localization, like for example, during auto. So for this event, uh, speaking of auto, so speaking of, for this event, one of the new autos we run is a six note where we shoot on the move for our first two notes. And that's one of the key things we tried to work on is being faster to the midline, because we knew at Champs there would be a lot more elite teams, a lot more teams with six notes, five notes, just race to the center line, and we wanted to be there as fast as possible. So are you uh, looking at, um, you know, talking about that, we are starting to see more teams do that, kind of that counter auto, right, mm -hmm. where they're just immediately going, just almost just nudging mm -hmm. the notes out of the way. Yeah. Is that meant to help counteract that, or do you have a different strategy in place potentially too? Yeah, so when we like when we potentially miss a note in auto, uh, this relates to what Brendan was talking about, the beam break sensors in the indexer. We actually, during auto, we check if we actually picked up a note. So instead of just like picking it up, it not being there, and going back to shoot anyway, what we'll do is we'll check our beam breaks here, and I can't really reach it, but all the way back here. And if we don't have a note, we realize that, and we switch to slide down the midline and go for the next one. So for example, we originally intended to go for the one far close to the right along the wall. Uh, we realize we miss it, and we'll just slide over to the next one, pick that one up, and then shoot it. What kind of feedback is the drive team using uh, during a match as well, too, to mm -hmm. get different signals or uh, different ways of knowing that they're good to shoot, things like that? Yeah, that was actually one of the things we worked on specifically this year, because uh, this is our first year running one controller, so we have one driver behind the glass. Yeah. Um, and so obviously we need everything to be condensed and easy to use and as much automation as possible. So right off the bat, you can see we have this really big LED strip up here, and we essentially use different colors on the strip to signal whether we have a note 
uh, whether we're ready to shoot or whether they're ready to amp. So there's a bunch of different codes for, oh, we're loading the amp. We're ready to amp, ready to trap, we're locked on, ready to shoot. Or if we're trying to, for example, run a ferry strategy, we also have different modes to signal, or different colors to signal those modes. You know, that, that's an interesting you mentioned with the one driver. When we were talking uh, 2056 just a couple weeks ago, they've also gone to one mm -hmm. uh, driver as well, too. That can be kind of intimidating, I think, for some teams to think about wanting to go with that. Mm -hmm. what, what really made that changeover uh, easy and seamless for your team? Uh, just lots of practice. I mean, one of the things that we're lucky enough to have at our field or at our shop is a practice field where we can run matches with all the different setups we want to try. So I would just suggest, like, if you're looking to experiment with different control schemes or like, really anything, is just try to get as much practice as you can with like every system and sort of evaluate what like works better from looking at like data is like, oh, we're doing more cycles with this or we're doing less cycles with this. Like that's sort of what drives our decisions to or like drives us making these decisions basically. Well Sidra Circus, thank you so much for telling us more about your robot. Another uh, absolutely inspirational robot and team uh, that you brought here. So thank you for being such a great inspiration to the community. There's a lot that people can learn from this. So we can't wait to see of course how you do. Hopefully keeping that streak alive as well. And good luck here with the rest of the championships. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions.